Good morning, Caterina. Good morning, Father Angelo. Good morning, Bartolomeo. Uh, after Holy Mass, I'll take you to Casa Gaia. It's all been arranged. By the way, how is your old aunt doing? Not well, unfortunately. I was thinking of going back home tonight to take care of her. By all means, that's the best thing you could do. We must show charity to our loved ones before anyone else. Three people met in this oratory nearly two centuries ago. Their names were Bartolomea Capitano, Caterina Gerosa, and Father Angelo Bosio. This was a very important day. That day, in fact, marked the beginning of a glorious adventure for the Suore di Carità, all of which was not possible without the determination and the enthusiasm of Bartolomea. She unfalteringly put her trust in God and accepted the plan he had in store for her. Her dream to build a community dedicated to the youth, to the poor, the sick and needy, was finally taking form. We're in a charming town named Lovere, located on the northern shore of Lake Iseo, in the Bergamo district. It is here that our story begins. In an enchanting place that stands out amidst mountain and lake like a precious jewel. This house, once known as Casa Gaia, later known as the Conventino, is the mother house of the Institute today. It was within these very walls that everything started. In November 1832, the building was in a notably poor condition, due in part to a fire that nearly destroyed it. However, for Bartolomea and Caterina, what remained of the house was more than enough to start their new undertaking. This is Father Bozio's account of what happened that very special day. Here in front of a picture of Mary, placed between two candles, they kneeled down and offered their lives to God with sentiments of great devotion. They devoted themselves to helping the poor in the best way possible, knowing this would please God. And when the few people went away, Caterina too went home to help her elderly aunt who was ill and needed her assistance. Bartolomea, now poverty-stricken, remained there all alone with a picture of Mary. From her previous home, she took a bed for herself, two tables, and a few benches that would be necessary for the future school. Nothing more than this. But by now, the seed had been dropped, and soon it would sprout, and the young plant would grow into an enormous tree that would bear many fruits. For certain, the two characters in our story were very different from each other. Not only age-wise, Catherine was 23 years older than Bartolomea, but for their characters, their social positions and even aspirations. Since she was a child, Bartolomea was strongly attracted to the idea of dedicating her life to God and becoming a saint. During her lifetime, one particular episode became famous. One that took place while she was attending school with the Sisters of St. Clair. Now, children, would you like to play a game? Yes! Well, now, come and sit around me. Valeria, you sit here. I know that all of you love God. But is there someone who would like to be the first to become a saint? I do! I do! Me. I, do. I do! Me! Now, this is the game. Whoever draws the longest straw, she 
will be the first saint. Do you like the game? Yes! Shall we give it a try? Yes! Okay then, stand up. Anna. Valeria. Lucia. Giovanna. Maria. And Bartolomea. <gasps> ah, yes, Bartolomeo, you are the lucky one. With the straw in her hand, she ran into the church and prayed in front of the statue of Mary with all her devotion, pronouncing the following words. Oh, Lord, I want to be a saint, a great saint, a saint soon. In addition to her quick-witted and lively intelligence, she even possessed an innate sense of leadership. She was looked up to by her peers and girls younger than her as she guided them through studies, prayer and even recreation. Katharina instead excelled in practical matters and organisational skills. As a young girl, she benefited from the trust of her uncle Ambrogio, who often took her along to various marketplaces to trade in animal skins and leather. The fact that she was so good at figures helped her become a true and genuine businesswoman. Today we are going to Iseo, Caterina. How many skins must we deliver to Mr. Montini? Let me check, Uncle. OK, six. There are six hides in all. Have you already fixed a price? Yes, Uncle. And remember, too, that Mr. Montini still has to pay for last month's order. She was so precise with figures that her uncle Ambrogio decided to entrust her as the thriving business's bookkeeper, despite her young age. Thanks to their hide tanning and trading business, the Gerosa family became one of the best-off families in Lovare. Nevertheless, like in many other cases, the family heritage played a large role in creating tensions that divided the family. Katharina's father was not highly considered by his people, and her mother, Giacomino, was not accepted by the prestigious Giroso family, as her behaviour was not aristocratic like their own. Soon after being widowed, she was literally driven away from her home by the family. Katharina and her sister Rosa, still burdened by their father's death, was forced to witness the dramatic events as they took place, and this tragedy inflicted indelible wounds on their souls. Bartolomea, even if she was not rich like Caterina, came from a family whose economic conditions were quite favourable, though this never prevented her from understanding the situation of the many poor people who knocked on her door. During those years, a terrible famine put many people in the direst of conditions. After being exposed to so much misery, the desire to dedicate her life to helping the poor and needy began making its way into her heart. These stairs lead to the convent of St. Clair, the exact stairs Bartolomea must have used the day she entered the sisters' boarding school to continue her studies, honouring her mother's request, who hoped to keep her far from danger, considering her enterprising and vivacious nature. She spent six years in the nuns' boarding school, during which she matured not only physically into a lovely young woman, but above all, spiritually. Her personal growth was greatly influenced by Sister Francesca, 
who among many other things, proposed Saint Aloysius Gonzaga as a role model to aspire to. Not only did Bartolomea listen attentively to the teacher's readings about Saint Aloysius's life, but she asked to borrow the book to reread his story, which made such a great impression on her. Tell me, Bartolomea, I see you so engrossed in that book on Saint Aloysius's life. What is it that attracts you to this book? This is the life of Saint Aloysius, Sister Francesca. It is here that I will find the way to become a saint. <laughs> her mother, knowing how much her daughter wished to have this volume for herself, arrived one Sunday in the parlor with that very gift. This is for you, Bartolomeo. I knew how much you wanted it. Oh, thank you, Mum. It's a wonderful gift. When you finish reading it, you can tell me about his life. Of course, Mum. If only you knew how much I've learned. After obtaining her diploma in teaching, the time had come to go back home and help her parents run the store, which, after two centuries, is still there, despite numerous changes. At the end of her period with the Sisters of St. Clair, Bartolomea wrote the following words in her diary. It's truly a great blessing to have studied here, where I learnt to love God and understand how wonderful it is to follow Him. These simple words help us understand how greatly she was influenced by the sisters' teachings. While Bartolomea was still living her carefree youth, Katharina had already begun living the phase in a life known as maturity. Her life was not simple, by any means. Within a few years, the Gerosa family went through a series of losses, forcing her against her will to share a considerable heritage with her aunt Bartolomea and her sister Rosa. After declining every marriage proposal, she was free to use her money and her time to carry out the very acts of goodwill that were so dear to her heart. She began helping young women by taking them off the streets, giving them a home and a job. That's how, little by little, Lady Katharina was known to the residents of Lovarian province as the Lady of Charity. Only till Christ crucified did she confide her hopes and her endless worries about the amount of fatigue that her works were costing her. A great deal of this exhaustion was most likely attributed to her commitment to constituting a girl's oratory that so far hadn't existed in Lovery. It was the parish priest, Father Rusticano Barbolio, who proposed the idea to her and she, like always, opened the doors to her home. The goal was to form a prayer group with the girls that would meet every Sunday, offering recreational activities as well. Most likely it was during one of these sessions that Katerina and Bartolomea met each other. It was a meeting that was to change their lives forever. Bartolomea entered Katerina's orbit like a meteor. While Katerina was calm and reluctant, Capitania was dynamic and enterprising. And in fact, as she set foot in the parlor of the lady, things changed radically. The informal group of young women, happy to be in fellowship with others devoted to Christian values, in a short time turned into a Marian association one in strict accordance with official rules, with regulations of its own and a fixed calendar. So, there will be a meeting this Sunday to plan the celebration of Our Lady, okay, girls? Do you all agree? Katharina yes, was not at all jealous of the young, ambitious woman. Rather, she admired her intelligent and dynamic spirit. This is how an extraordinary alliance formed between Bartolomea, the energy behind all the initiatives, and Katharina, who developed them from behind the scenes.
We are now in another place that is symbolic of the pilgrimage to our origins. It was here that in November 1826, a hospital was opened, where Bartolomea and Caterina would eventually spend a great deal of their energy. The hospital was opened in one of the many Gerosa family estates and was a bequest that Uncle Ambrogio left before passing away. It was not a large hospital. There were 10 hospital beds with two fixed nurses assisting, while the town's doctors would come and visit the patients. From the hospital, patients could enjoy a stunning lakeside view, making their stay peaceful and serene. For many residents in Lovere, who were taken away from filthy beds where they were sadly abandoned, this hospital was a real blessing, thanks to the loving care of Caterina, Bartolomea and many friends, these poor people were able to find comfort in a clean and friendly environment. Even in this case, Caterina withdrew from the responsibility of taking charge of the structure. Miss Caterina, I firmly believe that it is up to you to run this hospital. We need a person who people look up to and is right for the job. And I can think of no one that is better than you for this role. Father, please don't ask this of me. I don't feel prepared. To run a hospital, a person must have certain qualities that I don't have. Nevertheless, I could suggest the name of a person who I know would be the right candidate. Well then, tell me her name. And let's hope Providence will help us. Bartolomeo Capitano. She's good, intelligent, altruistic and full of initiative. She's the person you want. She'll give you great satisfaction, you'll see. And so it happened that Bartolomea ended up becoming the hospital's director and accountant. The friendship between the women continued wonderfully. Bartolomea, with her enterprising character, carried on her roles as teacher and organizer of recreational activities. Many a time she took her girls here in Sellere to a farmhouse that her family owned. Here they spent their days in singing, dancing and prayer. But Bartolomea sometimes came here alone to meditate and listen attentively to God's voice that instructed her to give life to a congregation based on the ideals of charity. Today the farmhouse looks very different from back then. But after all, the sisters did manage to conserve its original mold. To this very day, it has remained a place for meditation and prayer, a place where dreams and memories are made. And Bartolomea's dream was to dedicate her life to others, establishing an institute with rules of its own. She was convinced that this was the plan God had in store for her. It was during one of her annual spiritual retreats in Sellere that this conviction of hers became clearer. And in the retreat diary of 1826, she wrote, These meditations are primarily aimed at lifting my spirits, or at least stabilizing them. After a good hour of humble considerations about the different religious spirits, I sincerely declare, as if I were before God, that the Lord is calling me to an institute whose goal is to aid those in need, and that this is what, at the point of death, I will be happy to have embraced. And once again in 1830 she wrote, I received the Holy Communion today with much more affection, devotion and peace than yesterday. Once again, I felt the sudden urge to set everything in motion and to have no rest till the desired institute is at work. And I felt an enormous confidence that this may soon take place. And what about Caterina? What role did she play in Bartolomeo's explicit plans? We do know that toward the beginning she was not very enthusiastic about her friend's ideas, but later on, thanks to her great trust in her companion, she decided to follow her. Her efforts to persuade her were successful, as we can gather from a letter Capitanio wrote to Gerosa. The following words powerfully convey this. I ardently long for the moment when I can join you to act in God's glory toward the benefit of others. We must do everything to make this happen as soon as possible. 
We mustn't in any way hinder the will of God. We must place ourselves in his hands and seek his will only and the well-being of our people. Your most devoted, Bartolomea. After a period of Katharina's absence when her older aunt fell ill, the two women settled permanently at the convent. The days were very busy for both of them. First there was mass, and then there were the young orphans to take care of, then classes to hold, the oratory, the hospital, and hundreds of other tasks to attend to. In the evenings, they would sit together near the candlelight where they drafted their manuscript of rules. Initially, Bartolomé listed 14 points that became rules for the future institute, known today as the Document of Foundation. However, the fact remained that an already approved document was more easily accepted by civil and religious authorities. For this, Father Bozio, always mindful of all matters in the small community, managed to obtain for Bartolomé the statute of the Daughters of the Charity of Saint Antida Ture, based in Napoli and Vercelli. Bartolomé was enthusiastic about this and transcribed the entire document as the spirit that characterized it was very similar to her own. Father Angelo Bozio's role was surely an important one in those delicate moments during the Institute's foundation. Nevertheless, he remained the little community's precious spiritual counselor for a long time after. The spring of 1833 heralded the arrival of lovely weather. In no way could one foresee the drama that would soon destroy the small community. Returning from religious services, Bartolomé began feeling ill with chills and fever. The doctor's diagnosis did not leave much hope. She was dying of consumption. Bartolomeo's agony was long and painful. Nevertheless, comforted by the presence of many who loved her and considered her the perfect role model for Christian living, her room got fuller by the day. Her pupils, the orphans, and her friends from Lovere came to listen to her last words as she lay in bed burning with fever. These were her last sacraments to continue the achievements that they had yet to fulfill. In the meantime, their project to build a chapel was carried on. My dear sister, I have decided to stop the builders for a while so you could rest better. No, let them continue. It gives me such joy knowing that Christ in the Eucharist will soon come to live in our house. At least let me close the shutters. So you can sleep a little. Father Angelo, seeing that her health was rapidly deteriorating, pushed toward drafting a contract for the new institute. On June the 22nd, Capitanio was on her deathbed when she signed the Institute's first and only legal act with her trembling hand. We like to remember one of her lovely and peaceful reflections she liked to read to her students as dictation. In our hands, we hold a treasure whose value we often do not know, time. If we use it well, our body and soul will benefit. Just imagine how happy we would be in our last days if we knew that we used the time that our wonderful God gave us wisely. Now let's not waste our time in vain and useless trifles. In the end, only that which will give us eternal happiness will be dear to us. July 26, 1833. In the heart of summer, Bartolomea Capitano departed from this world to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sadly, the last left her friend and companion in total and utter dejection. According to popular tradition, it was right here in front of this fountain that Caterina, filled with anxiety and on the verge of returning to her home, 
met Father Bozio. Their meeting was crucial. After the death of a dear friend, spirit and inspiration behind the Institute, Katerina did not feel up to the task of taking the work into her own hands. But Father Angelo, knowing her faith and her potential, reassured her. This is how the idea began to make its way into her mind that Bartolomea did not actually leave her alone. Rather, she understood that her help from God's side would be even greater. Reassured by this certainty, she conquered her own fears and reopened the doors to the conventino, welcoming needy brothers and sisters once again with open arms. And it wasn't much later that help arrived from above. A few months later, the civil authorities approved the institute, and in two years, the new community already had six sisters that wore a habit of their own. But other trials were in store for the congregation. In 1836, unexpectedly, an epidemic of cholera broke out in the area. Katerina knew that it was the moment to show proof of the charitable spirit that gave life to the small community. After a prayer session, she told her five companions the following. Our God has come to us in the guise of cholera. If any of you wants to help these brothers, Follow me, but I will not oblige you. All the sisters followed her and were protected from contagion. From that moment on, the news of the community spread not only throughout the area, but to places further away. Other hospitals and schools, first in Lombardy and then in Trentino, requested the sisters. It was the beginning of an exodus. The essence that delighted Lovere in the first part of the 1800s began to spread everywhere. In 1840, the Institute was approved by the Holy See. This was followed by the religious profession of the First Sisters. Caterina chose the name Sister Vincenza, deriving from Vincent de Paul, in her desire to dedicate herself, like him, to the poor and the social outcasts, God's most beloved. Sister Vincenza's earthly existence ended on the 29th of June, 1847. In this fresco, we see the last days of the saint when she already felt that the crucial moment was about to arrive. Here she desired to speak to a young sister who was terribly ill, presaging that both of them would soon meet each other at the gates of heaven. Like Bartolomea, the death of Sister Vincenza left the residence of Lovere with the sudden feeling that they had lost a saint. After the beatification of Bartolomea in 1926, the plan was to build an even larger santuario that would enclose the pre-existing church of the 1800s. In 1931, the first brick was laid, and finally, in 1938, the temple was consecrated and blessed. The Temple of Lovere as an architectural, sculptural and artistic whole presents itself like a solemn chant that exalts Christ King of Virgins and the value of a chant that's already heralded at the church's entrance. On a parapet at the entrance there are the symbols for the four evangelists in bronze. On the front walls, two very significant episodes from the Gospels are depicted. On the right, there's the Sermon on the Mount, which signifies the life journey for those who've been chosen and who've accepted to follow Christ. To the left, there's the resurrection of the widow's son in Nime, the culmination of all acts of charity that the consecrated virgins are called to do for the welfare of others. Upon entering, the church bursts into song. Mosaics on the columns show us the proud and wise virgins of the famous parable in Matthew.
On the walls of the lateral naves, a fresco shows a long procession of sixty virgins and martyrs leading to the apses, where the figure of Christ awaits them, letting them enter the immense heavenly light. The procession of virgins is led by the two saints, Bartolomea and Vincenza. We see them once again in a large fresco, situated directly above the organ where their works of charity have been depicted. Their bodies rest inside two crystal and marble urns, one on each side of the central altar, as if theoretically embracing the Eucharist. The santuario, with its decorative elements, is also an educational instrument, as was the custom in the first centuries of the Church, a time when the population learned the great truths of Christianity from the highly expressive and breathtaking series of paintings on the walls or the majestic stained glass windows in the cathedrals. We left off in 1938, the year of the temple's consecration. But in 1950, Lovere was celebrating again, but this time for an even more important event. The canonization of the two saints was a truly extraordinary event, with the participation of the entire community as in other moments in the past. There are many signs today that bear witness to how the people of Lovere revere Bartolomea and Vincenza. From the streets they name after them, to the care they take in preserving their story. The saints are present everywhere. And it is touching to know that their remains are still here, as if lovingly watching over the mother house of their congregation and the entire community of Lovere. This is the light that opened the eyes of Bartolomea and Vincenza. These are the heavens that they contemplated. This is the fresh air they breathed. Their lake, their mountain, and the streets that they traveled quickly and humbly, with hopes flooding their hearts. Cardinal Giovanni Colombo, on the jubilee of their canonization, fully summed up the greatness of this small story that took place on this strip of land that neither wanders from the banks of Lake Diseo nor crosses the wall of mountains that tower over it. It's the story of two women very different from each other for their ages, characters and aspirations, but united in their desire to serve God by helping others. This is the dream that was fulfilled through them, but also embraced the entire world because charity is without time or limits. The torch was passed from the founder's hands to her spiritual daughters, becoming brighter as it passed through other times and places, arriving here today using these enthusiastic words spoken by Bartolomea as its main reference. I am completely smitten by the charity that Christ practiced throughout his life. And Vincenzo's evangelical advice. God visits us in the guise of the poor. We are called to love them. Let us do so. <laughs> 